Here of Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. We're doing a prophetic segment, more of a teaching segment this evening. Um, my wife was actually going to be doing one for Shabbat, but the brother that was coming on uh, to do the interview was not able to make it, so it's been postponed until Tuesday. I do apologize because I know many of you guys were looking forward to the uh, Saturday teaching, uh, but it did not did not work out. So, so kind of today we're going to do one, and because there was one that was on my heart that I wanted to share with you, and and it's in light of. Uh, Looking back at the prophecy that Nathan, the young man that had the near-death experience in Israel, a little statement that he had made about Obama and Gog, uh, being Gog, and what would happen to him. He would be buried in the land of Israel. And we'll talk about that momentarily, but there is a prophecy in the book of Baruch that very clearly could be the very man that Nathan sees himself. Now, whether or not it's Obama or not, I cannot say myself. Um, I find it interesting, but I'm going to share with you some very interesting things that are going on. Uh, the passage that I found in the book of Baruch will also line up with Daniel, chapter 7, verses 23 on down, also looking at the book of Revelation um, and, and looking at the prophecies there. So let me first take you over to... Daniel chapter 7, and I want to begin with verse 23. This is the interpretation of the fourth beast that Daniel sees here. And then we'll go into uh, Barak's prophecy, and I'll also, for those of you that are not familiar with Barak, I will give you a little bit of background on him. He's mentioned many, many times in our Bible uh, by uh, the prophet Jeremiah, also by the, uh, only by the prophet Jeremiah. I take that back, not Nehemiah. Nehemiah mentions another Barak, but Jeremiah speaks about him quite often. He was the scribe for Jeremiah, writing many of his own scrolls, but he also prophesied and wrote of his own. So anyway, let's go to the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, okay, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So the fourth kingdom is actually the fourth beast. And it just basically obliterates the earth, all right? And ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a times, times, and a dividing of time. That's three and a half years, by the way, when you break that down, that is exactly, a time is one year, times, and then uh, times is two years, and then a half a time is half a year, so it's three and a half years exactly. But the judgment shall, shall sit, and they uh, shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom, and the dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve uh, and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for Daniel... My cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Now, I might mention to you, in this regards right here, that uh, when we're looking at this particular prophecy here, we do see that the Messiah is definitely in the advent because his kingdom is set up. His dominion will be set up at this time as well. Uh, and then this one that rules for three and a half years. Now, there's many that have, that have suggested that Obama is the Antichrist, but I still contend that it is Pope Francis, or now when I say Pope Francis, there could be another Pope still yet to come, because there's no other organization in all the world other than the Vatican itself that has dominated the world's powers. Now, I will say this, they work hand in hand together, both Barack Obama, if he is indeed part of the beast system and or the fourth kingdom, uh, as far as that, he works hand in hand with the Vatican. Now, let me explain to you why I say that. You may not quite understand that. If you look at Revelation 
chapter 17. Let's take a look at this real quick. And so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. Now the Pope of Rome does exactly that. His mass is blood, all right. It's not the blood of Christ. If it is, it's only the guilt of the blood of Christ. I will agree with that. Uh, but notice they, they're sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. The beast is the power. The beast also represents Satan, all right? And she's sitting there. The beast is what's taking her around. The beast is what she uses to fight her battles all over the world. And upon her forehead was written the name Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, an abomination of the earth. Because the fourth kingdom, by the way, is a Babylonian or a Roman empire. We find this out in the prophecies of Barach, all right? And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. And the beast that I saw us was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. They behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. All right. Now, <clears throat> when we look at this right here, notice that beast again this goes right into perdition, okay? We find out when you're looking over here in the book of Daniel, the same thing. The beast goes in, it takes us right up to the kingdom of the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, all right? But <clears throat> here comes the question, how does Obama play into all of this? Well, Let's look at the prophecies here in the book of Bruach. We're going to look at chapter 39. It's a vision that he has about the latter days, and he's very troubled at this vision that he has. But we're going to look mainly at the interpretation of the vision that the angel gives to Bruach. And he says here, and he answered and said, it's chapter 39, uh, to me, Baruch, this is the interpretation of the vision which you have seen, as you have seen the great force with which lofty and rugged mountains surrounded. This is the word. The days come, and this kingdom will be destroyed, which once destroyed Zion. All right? That's the Babylonian kingdom. Is that right? What does the book of Revelation call her? Mystery Babylon. Right? It's the Roman Empire that takes over from the Babylonians. So she's called Mystery Babylon. All right? And it will be subjected to that which comes after it. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Who do you think went to the Vatican to get permission uh, on what they're going to do? President Rouhani. He sent his delegate. Even he went there himself. Not just his delegation a couple of years before he did. He goes to the Pope of Rome. Let me tell you something. When you go to the Pope of Rome, buddy, you are bowing down. You are, you are acknowledging that the Pope is your daddy. My gosh. Anyway, so the day is coming. The kingdom will be destroyed, which once, once destroyed Zion, and it will be subjected to that which comes after it. And after a time, the kingdom will be destroyed, and another and a third will arise, and that also will have dominion for its time, and it will be destroyed. And after these things, a fourth kingdom will arise, whose power will be harsh and evil, far beyond those which were before it, and will rule many times as the forest of the plain. And it will hold firmly for a time, and will exalt itself more than the cedars of Lebanon. That's the Roman Empire from the time after Constantine. When the Vatican, you know, the Vatican was almost destroyed by the French Revolution. And the Pope was imprisoned and everything under, under Napoleon, right? But after that, there's your fourth kingdom, and it rises up, and it's been a powerful movement ever since then. It's been ruling for quite a long time.
right? And when I say ruling, remember that kingdom, by the way, is being, it's being, remember, it's the, we find out in Daniel that the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom, all right? And, the, and we find out in Revelation that that woman, Babylon, Mystery Babylon, that woman there, which is the Roman Catholic Church, see? She's riding the beast. She rides the, the powers of the earth. Remember that? And the scripture, I believe, also says in Revelation, if, but let's go down and look at it again. Um, she sits on many waters. Is that right? That's peoples, lands, nations, etc. Um, yes, here we go. Verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, for that is written with called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So they're going to turn on her. It'll happen. Don't worry. So but let's move on here with this. Now watch what happens. Let me back up. This is in Baruch. We're in verse 5, about halfway in there. It says, And it will hold firmly for a time, and will exalt itself more than the cedars of Lebanon. Watch what else they do. And by it, the truth will be hidden. Verse 6. By it, by what? By this fourth kingdom, by this Babylonian kingdom, the, what is it? Mystery Babylon. And by it, the truth will be hidden. Do you not know, like when the Dead Sea Scrolls came forward in 1947, the Vatican got a hold of those Dead Sea Scrolls? Do you know they, they kept those scrolls secretly? They wouldn't even let Jewish scholars look at them for many, many years. I think it was at least 20 years before the Jews could finally get a hold of some. I mean, they'd trickle a few little fragments out here and there. Here, here you go. You can have this one here. Why, with Israel, with that being their land, you tell me how in the world could the Vatican get a hold of the Dead Sea Scrolls and not allow Jewish scholars to look at these books? And you really believe that I think that all the 800-some-odd scrolls that they found there, do you think I don't think they're not holding out? Sure they're holding out. The prophet Baruch says they're holding out on you. Says the truth will be hidden. You know, there's a lot of books out there that you'd be surprised at some of the things that are written in there. There's a book out there also by Moses where he talks about things that would happen at the coming of the Messiah. Oh my gosh. All right, friends, let's look what it says. All right, and, and by it, truth will be hidden. By what? By that Babylonian empire, the fourth kingdom, that mystery Babylonian empire. And all those who are polluted with sinfulness will flee to it, and evil beasts flee and creep into the forest. Look at that. And all those who are polluted with sinfulness will flee to it. That's exactly what they do. I mean, you're talking about practically every leader of the world's nations have fl fled right there to Rome. Oh, Mr. Pope, what do we do? Can we bow before you and, and ask your kindness. Can we get a little mercy from you, Pope, and a few dollars while we're here? No, he says, bring your dollars to him. Why do you think he got so rich from? My gosh. And when the time of its end and fall has approached, then the kingdom of my Messiah will be revealed. All right? The kingdom of my Messiah will be revealed. Now watch this. Barak is very interesting the way he puts this out. All right, which is like the fountain and the vine, and when it is revealed, it will root out the multitude of its host. Wow. When the time of its end, whose end? That's the Vatican's end, the Roman Empire, right when it's getting near for its end to come. And the kingdom of my Messiah, Bruach's Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, the second coming in our case, he will, it, it will, he will be revealed. 
That's going to be by your two witnesses. Which is like the fountain and the vine, and when it is revealed, it will root out a multitude of its host. Remember what the scripture says in Revelation 18.4? Let me just take you to it real quick, because we're right here by it over here in the book of Revelation. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Whose plagues? Rome's plagues. All right? So they're going to be, they're going to be the multitude of its hosts will be rooted out. That'll be by your two witnesses. And concerning that which you have seen, the lofty cedar which was left out of the forest, and the fact that the vine spoke those words with which it, you did hear, this is the word. All right? Because it does, there's one lofty cedar that's totally separated from the, the empire here. It says that last leader of that time will be left alive. When the multitude of his host will be put to the sword and he will be bound and they will take him up to Mount Zion and my Messiah will convict him of all his unlawful deeds and will gather and set before him all the works of his host. Now, is that going to be, is that leader, is he speaking of the Pope of Rome? Or could he be speaking of this man right here? President Barack Obama. Now, you have to understand, the woman that rides the beast, the beast is a power. The beast is Satan's demonic power. Remember what Satan said to Yeshua when he took him, when he was going through the temptations, and he takes him up on the pinnacle of the temple, shows him in a moment's time all the kingdoms of the world that ever were and that ever would be. Isn't that right? And he said, these are all mine. They're given into my hand. And I set up who I will over them. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give them unto you. Now, I'm just paraphrasing that right there. Now, Yeshua never debated with him whether or not they were his kingdoms or not. But he just told him the word of God. See, he wasn't going to bow down. And he wasn't going to take it by gift from Satan. He was going to buy it back with the purchase of his own life, and he did. But what's interesting, Satan, the beast himself, who sets up the powers on this earth. You have to understand, Barack Obama is only one of the generals. He's only one of the generals who the Catholic Church rides. The Pope of Rome is only riding on his back. See? That guy there only rides on the back of this guy right here, and he tells him to wage war. And, of course, this man here lifts the signal, and the ships go, the airplanes fly, and whatever else that, that, uh, that, that uh, the Pope says, that's what that man does. Now, here's why I kind of wonder, too. There's two reasons why I wonder if it's not going to be President Obama and he may get, by the way, he may declare martial law. If the unrest gets really bad in the nation, which is, it seems like what they're trying to make happen, they're trying to cause unrest over this situation with Mr. Uh, Trump over there. They don't want Donald Trump being the president of the United States. So they're trying to bring about so much civil unrest in the United States to where he'll be able to declare martial law. If he declares martial law, he could survive long enough to see that three and a half years when Rome is wreaking havoc all over the world. You know, the Bible says that they wage war against the saints. Pope of Rome is already setting those laws in motion already, you know, because what did he say? What did he say about that when they killed all the Jews there in, uh, in France there? The Hebdo newspaper there. Pope Francis didn't go out and condemn the Muslims for killing them. He just talked about hate speech. And he says, basically, he condoned what they did. As, you know, they ran their mouth, so to speak. Well, this is what they get. That's the way the Pope made it look like. And to think that the Jewish Congress, you rabbis, are about dumb enough to go out and sign a covenant with the Pope of Rome. Haven't you know better since? Don't you know nothing the prophet said? You guys need to wake up.
I'm ashamed at my own people for making a covenant with Rome. Do you not know that God told Moses, don't make any covenants with them when you come in the land? Don't you know what happened with making a covenant with Rome back there in the time of the Maccabees? After the Maccabee brothers there, they, yes, they liberated Israel from the Greeks, but then they went and made a covenant with Rome and put the wrong man in the priesthood. You know that Moses wrote about that, that they'd have the wrong people in there as, as priests and it would be the wrong priesthood? Didn't know that, did you? Yes, he did. Anyway, so he lives and he's judged by the Messiah. Condemned and sentenced to death. Now, I want to read one other thing that he says here and then I'm going to take you one other thing in closing here. In chapter 41, you see, in verse 2 of chapter 4, he says, And afterwards he will put him to death and protect the rest of my people, which will be found in the place which I have chosen. Now watch this. Chapter 41, verse 3, it says, I see many of your people who have withdrawn from your covenant and cast from them the yoke of your law. But I have seen others who have forsaken their vanity and fled for refuge beneath your wings. I think that's speaking of the... Uh, the Gentiles. Remember what it says? They'll take a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, show us your ways. And they're not going to be asking what the ways were of, um, of some of these other ones. And there's one other one I'm going to read for you in chapter 70 here of Baruch that I think is in this. I believe this does speak of the two witnesses. It says in verse 6 of chapter 70, And those things which were predicted have come to pass. Confusion will fall upon all men. Some of them will fall in battle. Some of them will die in torment and pain. And some of them will be destroyed by their own people. And he's talking about things that are going to happen in the last days. Another vision that Baruch has. Then the Most High will reveal those people whom he has prepared from before. And they will come and make war with the leaders that will be left. And whosoever survives a war will die in the earthquake, and whosoever survives the earthquake will be burned by the fire. Whosoever survives by the, by the fire will be destroyed by famine, and whosoever uh, of the victors and vanquished survives and escapes all these things mentioned before will be delivered into the hands of my, uh, my servant, uh, excuse me, in the hands of Messiah, for all the earth will devour its inhabitants." That sounds so much like Planet X, it's not even funny. But did you notice he says, Then the Most High will reveal those people whom he has prepared. From before, from before, in other words, they lived before. They will come and make war with the leaders that will be left. How are they going to do it? Earthquake. How else are they going to do it? Fire. Famine. Sounds like Revelation 11, doesn't it to you? Whatsoever they should do, this is going to happen. Earthquakes, fires, famines. That's how they do their war. That's how they do their battles. These, these peoples, peoples, why is, it, why is it plural there? Because there's more than one. Ones that have been prepared from before. From before, and they will come and make war with the leaders that will be left. What leaders are left? That's after they're already trying to kill each other like they're doing in these battles right now. But I wonder, like I said, this doesn't say it's the Antichrist that's delivered up in chapter 39 and chapter 40 that the Messiah is going to take out. It just says he's the leader of that fourth kingdom. Well, he may end up being over the United Nations, even if he doesn't declare martial law. So he still may lead all the wars into battle. And according to little Nathan... The young man that had the near-death experience that spoke about this, he says that, it's, that Gog is Obama and that he will lead the world's nations to a battle against Israel. I can imagine that if, he get, if, he, if Israel doesn't do what he wants. Let me just quote to you what Nathan said. First off, he speaks about the two witnesses. It's one of the things he says. So two of the dead people will arise. Two dead people will come back to life, one from here and one from here, and it will split in two. That's how it will happen. He's talking about the uh, Mount of Olives will split in two after those two dead men will raise up. Because remember, they do kill those two witnesses. But this is what he says here. He says, this Mashiach, 
I mean, the Mashiach, he will fight against Obama. Because he's already talking about how that Obama is Gog and Obama has led 70 nations against Israel to come to battle against them. All the United Nations is that Russia will be involved, South Korea. Uh, there's actually some nations that will not be involved in that battle, according to Barak. And he says those will be the ones that God will spare. It says he will fight against Obama and will not only that he will, not only that, he says he will kill him and bury him in the land of Israel. And he says, and I saw that. Now, I can't say, I don't know. I really don't know. I just think it's very odd that in the book of Baruch, it speaks about the world leader that's leading all these battles here for Rome. There, he's doing it, remember, he's doing it for this guy right here. Remember, in Revelation, the Antichrist, false prophet, even the beast, they're all thrown into the bottom and into the lake of fire. But there's this one leader that he is dealt with in Israel. And by the way, let me just make sure I read that last part. This leader of that time will be left alive when the multitude of his hosts will be put to the sword and he will be bound and they will take him up to Mount Zion and my Messiah will convict him on all his unlawful deeds. Now, I can't say. I really can't say which one. I do know they work hand in hand. This man right here, he's the boss. That's why he's got his little white hat on. That's why he sat on the Temple Mount there, or not Temple Mount, but he sat in Mount Zion, and he sat right there at King David's tomb, pretending like he's the son of David. God's got a lot of issues with this man. He should have never went to the tomb of David. He should have never went to that upper room and put a crown on his head. I wouldn't have any issue at all. If he went like he's dressed now, he's got every right. He professes to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. I don't fault him for that. But to put a crown on your head and go sit there in the upper room as if you are the Mashiach, I do have a problem with that. You know, it reminds me too, when the British were taking Jerusalem, there was a wise man that told the leader of the British armed forces, he said, when you go to take Jerusalem, because he always rode his horse, it's back during World War I, he said, when you get up to the gates of Jerusalem, he said, get off of your horse, sir. I forget which man told him this. He said, get off your horse, sir, and walk in with your horse. He said, but the king of, because the king of kings, he will ride in on his horse. And he's the one that's to ride in. And Allenby, when he came up there, he dismounted his horse and went through the gates of Jerusalem in respects to the true Messiah, Yeshua. The Pope could have learned some good lessons from him. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, prophetic segment of our broadcast. Shalom.